I'm about as real as they come. All my beats tailored by Joe. Digital. Maserati, Rick, and Detroit. The Convertible bird in Miami. Yo. Graduated summa cum laude. Strip club made a tsunami. Carlton Hines with the ball game. Rayful Edmonds with the snowflakes. Craig Pettis in the M Town. Sal Magluta with the boat game. Falcone with the cocaine. Like Freeway Ricky with the plug game. Like Monster Cody in South Central. Larry Davis from Close Range. Was calling you that one? Well, that's my mother was calling me that. My oh. mom gave me that name. Okay. Speaking of which, shifting gears real quickly, um, se Supreme Sentencing, Supreme McGriff's Sentencing. Yeah. Um, have you gotten any backlash about your feelings about that? Because he allegedly murdered your mom. And nah. You know what? You know, check this out. Look, Bray, me and Brain had a relationship. We used to be friends at one Worldstarhiphop.com. And then it, it changed. That's how the streets is. Right. You see what I'm saying? Like, but it was funny to hear Irv on the radio talk, like, talking about, about Prem and, and, and saying that he's, you know, want to, like, want to end it. Because he got life, you know what I'm saying? He don't want to sit around in the pants, he's ready to die. Tell him, don't do that, man. He's going to hang up. He, he sounds like weak, like a weak person. Mm. You see what I'm saying? And then Irv should be smart enough not to say that, even if that's what he really is. You right. see what I'm saying? Right. You know, but he sounds like the weak guy I thought he was. You know, under those circumstances. And even when it's, it's almost like, even after, okay, you got life in the penitentiary, what do you, what do you want to, like, what do you want to die for? Now you should live in the penitentiary so your name lives. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Right. Live up to your name. See, the difference is no, your reputation doesn't mean anything because everybody there is like you. Wow. When you hit the max. You see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it, it's nothing. The reputation, now you got to be what you were on the street, but yourself. See, everybody that was there that did everything was an outsider that was paid to do it. It wasn't him. Mm. You see how I mean? we, it looks, you, some people really look strong, and it's their influence mm -hmm. that's really strong. And they're really weak individuals. See, I didn't have anybody to go to. There was nobody to run to right. in that space. So I had to be strong enough to do everything that I was doing on my own. I had a bunch of youngins with me. And I put the young boys with me because they, they didn't have knowledge like, the older people had respect for them for reasons that I didn't understand. Right. You see what I'm saying? Because it was old, it was old events that they had this respect and, and fear of praying from. And I, and I didn't care about that. I mean, the young boys don't really care about the OG stand for old goat. Mm-mm. Wow. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it doesn't mean anything to me. And it, it didn't mean anything while they was on the street. I was telling them that. And I'm still telling them that. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Because we're married until death do us part. So as long as he's still breathing, we got issues. Yeah. They said towards the end that he wound up not having any more money for legal defense and wound up using yeah. legal aid. So what about Irving, though? They're supposed to have something going, right? Ain't the little boy Lloyd? Don't he look like one of Santa's helpers? Oh, he, the little oh, boy Lloyd, he out there you. jumping around dancing and ain't bringing no money in? Can't help him with his lawyer fee? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's crazy. I mean, and, even, and that makes... Don't <laughs> make note of, of them being at Universal. Let's point out that I'm the lead selling artist through the Universal Music Group. And taking news for direct effect, Inc. Records bosses Irv Gotti Lorenzo and his brother Christopher were in a Brooklyn federal court on Wednesday to stand trial on money laundering charges for allegedly cleaning more than a million dollars in drug money for convicted drug dealer Kenneth Supreme McGriff. Defense lawyers denied the charges and claimed Gotti and his brother only associated with McGriff to create an aura of street credibility for their label. Now, the prosecution will attempt to prove Gotti and his brother received several cash-filled shopping bags from McGriff and later cleaned his drug profits through bogus film and music-related projects. Tonight, music mogul Irv Gotti got a lift from his attorneys and a verdict that found him not guilty on all counts. Me and my brother never did anything. We never did anything. Only thing we was guilty of as being friends with and, and knowing somebody who was from our neighbor. After the verdict, the prosecutors walked out of the courthouse and would only say this. We respect the verdict. It was a terse statement in contrast to the celebratory mood of Irv Gotti and rap star Ja Rule. Get ready, we're right away. coming, the Get music ready. is coming. I'm going to the studio right now, you understand? Regret it. Jay just nicknamed me Gotti because Dame Dash's son Boogie 
ha ha used to have trouble saying Irv. We was going to do a show, he came outside, and he said, Joe, I'm going to call you Gotti, and it stuck. I don't regret it at all. And at the time, Death Row used to call their uh, 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 artist inmates, inmates, and Bad Boy would be like, I'm a bad boy. So I said, Murder Inc., and I'll call it, they'll be murderers, which sounds crazy, yeah. but, you know, in hindsight, it worked. I yeah, had J-Lo going like this. <laughs> so, trying to get much more mainstream. What the government did, they didn't get a, a, a guilty verdict, but they sure took every dime from us, oh, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. because they, the, it started the day they raided the office. So the day they raided the office until this was over, it was steady. Oh, you got to get prepared. You got to get, and it's just sucking the money. That Like, I can't explain it. And, and, and everyone who's looking at me right now, I'm not an over-the-top spiritual guy, but, yo, know, God took over that, that court that moment. Court. And, right. Sue, I, I broke down. I ain't gonna lie. You didn't lie. cry. You didn't have a tear. I cried. Right. I cried, and I ain't ashamed of it. I cried like a baby. <laughs> Thank you. And let me just... Uh, tell you, I don't know why we have to tell you this, but their, their sister works as a hairstylist for the WNBC's <laughs> uh, news department, and, and we love her too. So, love Ange. Yeah, love, love Ange. <laughs> yo, yo, we back. It's your boy Papa La Mob Ties. We on our way to NY with it. Queens to be exact. All my niggas from NY Queens, y'all niggas get in the comment box, let it be known, real fucking G's, like we live around this bitch. Now, we about to cover one of the biggest, if not the biggest, nigga to come out of Queens. It's gonna be none other than Kenneth Supreme McGriff, head of the world famous Supreme team that included countless legendary members. We can't even really mention some we covered previously on the show but a little bit about preem he got he started out um i really i should say he got his name or most people know this he got his name um from being a part of the five percent nation um i honestly want to say he was also possibly a member of the founding queens group the seven crowns i could be wrong if i am i think it's in the comment box let it be known um but um the emergence their emergence i want to say started in 1985 or 86 um and by 87 they was big 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 dogs in the game i'm talking about the supreme team itself um supreme i guess some of the facts that we know um supreme is responsible for the hit that killed e-money bags um he they also allege that he's responsible for the hit that was put on 50 cent um i seen some places online say it was due to what 50 cent said in ghetto quran by naming um, the numerous drug dealers and I seen some places where it said it had something to do with murder Inc. He was also kind of a big um, the, the key and the whole murder Inc. trial a couple years back where they try to say Irv and Chris Gotti cleaned up some money for Supreme um, He he also put out the Donald Goins book um and and made it to a movie crime partner so if y'all ain't see that y'all go check it out um he, he was he was definitely a, a big dog this almost trying to transition the sad shit is by the end of his run i don't know if y'all heard but they said that he had to have legal aid um because the money was running short um you, you seen Gotti talk about how the government really probably figured that they wasn't going to get them, but they knew they can tie the money up and, and take a lot of the money. So it kind of looks like that was, that's what happened. Um, so it's just all around, all around wild. But that this kind of go to show you a couple things. That 50 was a real nigga. 
and shit just to be even thinking he could come come against some of these people even e money bags to to be honest um because he was also in a position where he was going against supreme the most surprising thing i always talk about the most surprising thing the movies are spot on almost sometimes I some shit I never knew. People y'all and some of y'all might even know it. That did the chick in the beginning of that fifty interview say that Supreme was responsible for killing Fifty's mom, a la the Get Rich or Die Trying movie. Man, it's your boy Pop a lot. Mob, 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 tie. Kenneth Supreme McGriff is a convicted drug trafficker, AMD boss of the world famous Supreme team. McGriff came to prominence in the early 1980s when he formed his own crack distributing organization which he called the Supreme Team based in the South Jamaica section of Queens, New York. Under McGriff's leadership, the gang's numbers swelled to the hundreds and came to control the crack cocaine trade in the Baisley Park houses, the neighborhood where McGriff was raised. In 1987, McGriff was arrested following a joint state and federal investigation and in 1989 pleaded guilty to engaging in a continuing criminal enterprise. He was sentenced to 12 years incarceration. McGriff was released from prison on parole in early 1994 after serving approximately seven years of his sentence. He was sent back to prison on parole violations by year's end, and served another two and a half years incarceration before being released in 1997. McGriff is alleged to have had a hand in the 2002 murder of Run DMC member Jand Master J, and was convicted of ordering the 2001 killing of Mob Deep affiliate e Money Bags. Federal authorities also accused him in connection with the attempted murder of 50 Cent. Persistent rumors suggest that McGriff felt 50 Cent had exposed too much of the drug kingpin in Jamaica, Queens and others involved in the drug trade through the lyrics of his song Ghetto Karan released in 2000. On February 1, 2007 McGriff was convicted of murder for hire at a federal court in the Eastern District of New York on charges that he paid $50,000 to have two rivals gunned down in 2001. The jury deliberated for five days before finding McGriff guilty of murder conspiracy and drug trafficking. On February 9, 2007, the same jury sentenced McGriff to life in prison. Throughout this case he was defended by a court-appointed attorney because nearly all of his assets had been seized. McGriff began serving his life sentence at ADX Florence, the federal supermax prison in Colorado but in 2011 was transferred to the United States Penitentiary, Lee, a high-security federal prison in Pennington Gap, Virginia. The narcotics kingpin at the center of the federal criminal probe engulfing one of rap music's leading labels is suspected of ordering several murders, including a double homicide in Baltimore and the revenge slaying of a New York rapper, the smoking gun has learned. As we've previously reported, an FBINIP probe targeting Kenneth Supreme McGriff is examining his close ties with rap titan Irv Gotti and the Murder Incorporated label. Investigators have alleged that McGriff, 43, bankrolled Gotti and has provided Murder Incorporated with muscle threats, violence, and intimidation. The federal investigation is also focusing on McGriff's alleged involvement in three murders during the summer of 2001 according to a confidential search warrant affidavit obtained by TSG. At the request of Brooklyn federal prosecutors who cited possible retribution by McGriff's henchmen, TSG agreed to redact small portions of the affidavit. Law enforcement officials contend that McGriff ordered Smith's murder to avenge the December 1999 killing of a friend, Colbert Johnson. The supposed role of Smith who was shot to death as he sat in a car parked on a Queens Street, in the Johnson homicide is not detailed in the affidavit sworn by Detective William Courtney. In late August 2001, when investigators raided a Baltimore stash pad used by McGriff, they found $30,000 in cash, loads of cocaine and heroin, and a particularly incriminating surveillance videotape. 
on the video which bears recording dates of July the 13th to the 16th, 2001 Smith is seen driving and parking his Lincoln Navigator on the Queens Street where he was gunned down on July 16th at 9.45 p.m. Investigators determined that the video was shot by Dennis Devine Crosby, a drug-dealing McGriff associate, and Nicole Brown, Crosby's girlfriend. According to the Courtney affidavit, Crosby and Brown videotaped Smith driving and congregating with his friends on 111th Road, the Queen's Village Street where the rapper would later be shot about ten times by gunmen. Last January, Brown told an NYPD detective that the surveillance video was shot from her home, with Crosby handling most of the filming. She also admitted personally videotaping Smith up until 20 minutes before his killing and that, two days after the murder, Crosby requested the videotape from her. The affidavit does not detail how the surveillance videotape, which Crosby shot from a nearby apartment, made its way to McGriff's stash house. While not well known outside rap circles, Smith recorded with Nas and Noriega and merited a post mortem shout out on a 50 cent cut. During an interview last year on Fox's Hannity Coombs, Russell Simmons mentioned Smith when he spoke of the unsolved killings of rap performers. They don't know who murdered Tupac, who murdered Biggie, who murdered D e Money Bags, who murdered Jam Master J, said Simmons. The Courtney affidavit also fingers McGriff for the August 2001 killing of Karen Claret, a criminal associate whom he suspected was cooperating with law enforcement. Claret, 28, and a friend were gunned down in a parking lot across from the apartment complex where McGriff maintained his drug stash pad. A confidential witness has told investigators that McGriff farmed out the Claret killing to a criminal cohort in return for forgiving part of a substantial drug debt. Though the Claret hit was successful, McGriff was angry because the homicides exposed his stash house and its contents to a search by law enforcement, according to the affidavit. That search turned up a gold mine of evidence, including proof that McGriff, using an alias, had attended a 2001 firearms training course a no-no for a convicted felon. Arrested on a federal weapons charge in December 2002, McGriff pleaded guilty in mid-2003 and was sentenced to 37 months in prison. The Courtney affidavit was prepared in connection with a court application to search a Jamaica. Queen's home where weapons used in the Smith and Claret homicides were reportedly stashed. A law enforcement source told investigators late last year that McGriff had arranged for the guns to be given to an associate, who was supposed to discard them. But the associate, a Queen's drug dealer with two felony convictions, disregarded these instructions and kept them instead. The McGriff associate believed that the Jamaica apartment, in a New York City housing authority complex, was clean since the tenant had never been arrested and there is no drug activity in the premises. For more information, please follow the link below the video.